The Gathering of Mana by Nicolas Poussin in the Louvre. At first glance, there is something unsettling about the picture. There seems to be too much in it, too many objects and people to look at, too many different things happening. At the time it was painted, even Paul Fréard de Chanteloup, who had commissioned it, reportedly had doubts. Convinced of his picture's worth, Poussin insisted that the story and the picture needed to be read more carefully. His advice must have been taken, since Chanteloup, whose first commission this was, went on to become one of his main patrons. The picture itself scored a lasting success. Soon afterwards, it was acquired by Louis XIV and became the subject of formal lectures at the Academy of Painting, where it was seen as heralding a new type of art, one that would make French painters celebrated throughout Europe. So what was this careful reading which revealed the picture's true worth? What made it the model of a whole new style? The multifarious groups which people the picture are its first intriguing feature. In the foreground, a woman breastfeeding her starving mother tells her son to wait his turn. A young man is showing something to an old one and giving thanks to heaven. On the right, a group of people are gathering the food which has fallen from the sky. Some behave calmly, others are fighting over it. Even infants are reaching out to grasp it. Behind them, in the centre of the picture, two men surrounded by many other people are pointing to heaven or offering a prayer of thanks. In the background, an encampment can be seen, flanked by a group of trees and a huge rock with an opening in it. Nearby, various people seem unaffected by the general excitement. They're asleep, lost in their own thoughts, or digging. At this stage in our examination of this picture, we may wonder what, in this apparently chaotic scene, with so many different people doing so many different things, holds it together and gives it unity. In other words, what is it really about? The answer seems obvious. As its title indicates, the picture shows the gathering of manna, an Old Testament story. Having escaped from Egypt, the Israelites are led through the wilderness by Moses and Aaron, who appear in the centre of the picture. Food is soon exhausted, and the people, now dying of hunger, begin to lose faith in God. God speaks to Moses and promises that the Israelites will now find every morning when they wake, manna, food from heaven, scattered on the ground around their camp. It will keep them alive. But this explanation is inadequate. Poussin seems relatively uninterested in the miracle. In this conventional treatment of the biblical scene, we clearly see the manna falling. This is what we're meant to notice. In this painting by Tintoretto, the miracle is immediately evident. God is physically shown. The miracle's divine origin accounts for half the composition. And the Israelites are joyfully gathering the manna. In Guido Reni's version, manna is less visible, but angels are scattering it. Moses is a massive figure and dominates the picture. There is none of all this in the Poussin. First of all, the food falling from heaven effectively becomes a mere detail of the picture. The dark sky on the right. The falling manna all but hidden in the folds of a woman's dress. Various receptacles. Secondly, the divine origin of the miracle is only indirectly apparent. There are no supernatural apparitions, no angels, no God. Heaven is evoked by human gestures, raised arms, eyes directed upwards, prayerful gestures, surprised and joyful faces, and Moses, who points commandingly to heaven. Unlike Rennie's prophet, however, he is in the middle distance and relatively in shadow. This accords with Poussin's writings. In his letters, he never refers to eternal life and speaks of destiny or fortune rather than God. His real concern is less with the miracle than with the human reactions and emotions it provokes. But this still leaves our problem unsolved. Behind these seemingly chaotic emotions, can we find a unifying factor, a meaning?
The picture, which measures 1 meter 50 by 2 meters, can be taken in as a whole, and the eye moves freely around in it. And yet, there is an inescapable order. There seems to be a strategy to guide the spectator's attention. Firstly, with the help of light and colors, which automatically catch the viewer's eye. This very poignant group is brightly lit. Falling through gaps in the clouds, the sun's rays act like spotlights. Yellow, blue, the flesh tones of the child, all increase the effect. Once it has been caught, our attention must not wander, and the interplay of forms actively guides it. Within this group, the curve of the daughter's arm, the direction of the mother's gaze, and finally the arm of the child lead the eye from one member of the family to the next. This movement emphasizes the solidarity which unites them in the face of adversity. More generally, the eye is led to the right. From the man standing on the left to the cause of his wonderment in the center, and on to the old and young man who are telling others of the manner's coming. The pointing finger focuses our attention on the various reactions of the Israelites around Moses and Aaron. Adoration mixed with fear, respect for their leaders, deep reverence, or simple astonishment. A second female figure now catches our attention. She forms a symmetrical group with the first, who also has a child. Her yellow dress is brightly lit. Her kneeling posture makes us look at the figures on the right, and her pointing finger draws our attention to the boys fighting over the manor. What do Poussin's ordering of the scene and grouping of the figures mean? Behind the picture's formal logic lies the logic of the story it illustrates. There is the transition from a state of starvation to one of delight at finding the manor. Behind the foreground figures, Moses points to the source of the miracle, and Aaron thanks heaven for its benign intervention. Around them, two groups of figures express restored reverence for God and his representatives. But Poussin is not simply interested in this happy ending. Unlike the biblical text, his picture is able to give us a host of individual expressions and reactions, whose ambiguous elements make us stop and think. Agitation and confusion are the keynotes of the scene on the right, where the manna has been distributed. True, it may relieve the Israelites' hunger, but it also tests their moral fibre. Take the woman on the right. Is she, the usual assumption, urging her family to share their food with the old man sitting on the left? Or does she want them to seize the manna which has fallen at his feet? The surrounding scene is not all idyllic either. On one side, a fight has broken out over a handful of manna, and an ornamental goblet has been upset. On the other, there are two couples. One waits lethargically for the manna to fall and tastes it doubtfully. The other pounces on it with no thought of others. The feelings conveyed by the group on the left are more positive and stoical, manly calm and wonder, resignation in illness, charity, hope, gratitude. And the child's serene patience contrasts with the baby's unbridled appetite. This ambiguity is strengthened by the background. Behind the group on the right, two men seem to be wasting their efforts. On the other side, the gates of heaven seem to beckon. Whatever the picture's religious significance may be, one thing is now certain. Poussin is not simply depicting ideal or heroic figures, but ordinary people with all their contradictions, people in whom we can recognize ourselves. They sometimes face adversity bravely, but they have their failings too, and even good fortune does not always content them. In other words, Poussin has radically refashioned the Bible story. He turns this incident in the epic tale of a people and its guide, Moses, into a dramatic episode and insists on the moral test which faces each of its protagonists. Poussin's picture can also be seen as a meditation on human liberty. Clearly, divine help does not interfere with people's freedom to react as they see fit, and so earn merit or incur blame. The manor's salutary arrival still leaves them masters of their choices. In fact, this picture is Poussin's contribution to discussion of an issue which obsessed thinkers in his time, the question of free will. Does a natural order which follows ineluctable laws leave room for human freedom? 
This question was given a new acuity by the explosive growth of scientific inquiry in the 17th century. Poussin was 16 when Galileo invented his astronomical telescope, and 39 when he was put on trial. At the time when Poussin painted his manor, philosophers were struggling to preserve the concept of free will. His contemporary, Descartes, worked on the theory of freedom and free will from 1630 to 1645. He held that any idea or passion left human beings absolutely free to accept, reject, pursue or fly from it. He argued that this absolute freedom was their closest link with God. Around the same time, Corneille created the figure of Augustus in his play Cinna. Augustus shows that his will is free by resisting his natural impulses and pardoning his betrayers. This is a powerful and unexpected moment in the play, and a perfect example of the thing which gives us pleasure in a story, the unpredictability of human actions. And indeed, regardless of any philosophical or moral message, the gathering of manner raises the whole question of freedom in painting, the spectator's freedom to regard the picture from his own freely chosen angle, and the artist's freedom to tell a story which includes some surprises. Poussin's manner helps to pinpoint one of the things that painting can do particularly well. Drama and music can create strong emotions and deliver surprises, but they both impose their own sequence on their audience. A picture, on the other hand, is totally instantly there, but gives us more freedom to move around in it. Can Poussin keep these plus points and still find a way of nudging us towards the logic of the tale he's telling, and even confounding some of our expectations? Poussin's picture reflects the influence of a work of major importance for the theory of art, the poetics of the Greek philosopher Aristotle. The poetics dates from the 4th century BC. More or less forgotten for centuries, it was reconstructed from fragments, translated and published during the Renaissance. Today it is a classic text. When Poussin painted the manor around the age of 43, he was a frequenter of intellectual circles where this work was keenly discussed. In it, Aristotle formulates the basic rules which a work of art, and particularly a dramatic work of art, must obey to be successful. In Aristotle's view, the chief talent which distinguishes the artist from a skilled craftsman or technician is his ability to organise a work, to compose a story, and so maximise our pleasure by involving us in the human emotions he portrays. To rival the greatest poets, 17th century painters had to show that they were not simply skilled imitators of nature or masters of perspective, but that they too could captivate spectators by drawing them into well-told stories. In other words, the question raised by Poussin's gathering of manner is whether painting can equal the effects created and the pleasure given by the drama. Let us look at Aristotle's precepts. According to the Poetics, a work's formal qualities are one of the main sources of the pleasure it gives us. By formal qualities, Aristotle means the harmony and rhythm which enliven the parts, regardless of what they express. Symmetry of the whole. The marked sections of the painting, over which the eye ranges, create a certain harmony but they also give the picture, which is physically static, a sense of rhythm and sequence. But our pleasure must derive chiefly from immersion in a series of virtual human situations and logically connected actions. This allows us to recognise and discover the logic of powerful emotions without suffering the dangers and discomforts of action in the real world. In this way, art genuinely broadens our horizons. Seen in this light, Poussin's picture actually allows us to witness affecting and alarming situations, famine, war, without having to live through them. But Aristotle's demands go further. It is not enough to show us people in the grip of powerful emotions. We must be made to feel those emotions ourselves. A bad play simply gives us a series of situations and actions, but no sense of personal involvement. Poussin is thus applying one of Aristotle's basic precepts. He's constructing a story which is both logical and surprising. 
even though the picture's subject is a miracle, everything follows a logical course. The Israelites move from despair to joy, and from joy to faith. The fact that the manna's miraculous origin is not emphasised makes a story more probable. It's credible, and potentially interesting even to an atheist. But being logical does not stop it from being surprising, too. It takes some unexpected turns. It's not just a tale of misery giving way to joy. That would be banal and not particularly interesting. In fact, the manna turns out to be not just a blessing, but a test, and Poussin manages to inject an element of surprise into his portrayal of a well-known biblical scene. Poussin's manna is one of the key works of classicism precisely because it achieves what Aristotle sees as the essential aim of art. It uses a well-constructed story to rouse feelings of pity, fear, and humanity in the spectator. And so, having examined Poussin's picture carefully, we can measure the extent of its success. At first, we may find it disconcerting. Those swarming figures, those sober colours, that barren landscape, there's nothing here to catch our fancy at first glance. And yet, Poussin's aim is to give us pleasure, or, his own term, delectation. That pleasure is above all intellectual the pleasure of gaining new insights into others' feelings and emotions, and our own. Without formulating any theories, he thus helps us to understand what classicism means in 17th century art. He does this by showing us that rules, order and logic can all add to a picture's effectiveness. The manor measures just three square metres, but it gives us an enormous amount to look at and think about. At the same time, Poussin is not simply aping the theatre or the written word. He's giving us an experience that only painting can give us. A moment of intense contemplation. Instantaneous, ordered and carefully controlled. But leaving us entirely free to think our own thoughts and reach our own conclusions.